All right, let's get started. Welcome to the second video in this orchestration series. In our last video, we discussed the basics of foreground versus background. We covered the basic rules for properly orchestrating your material, including five strategies for differentiating your foreground from your background. In this video, we're gonna look a little deeper into the type of material that's typically found in your background. We'll discuss traditional approaches for orchestrating chord progressions and the music theory that informs these approaches. So with that, let's get started. The first thing we're gonna do is dive into some music theory and learn about the overtone series. So the basic idea behind the overtone series is that every pitch you hear actually contains multiple pitches inside of it, which are called partials. For example, let's say you pluck a string and it plays a C4 or middle C. This pitch is actually the first partial, which is also known as the fundamental. If you were to cut that same string in half and pluck it again, you would find the second partial, which sounds an octave higher than the fundamental. So in this case, we'd hear a C5, or the C an octave higher than middle C. If you were to cut the original string into a third of the original length, you would hear the third partial, which would be an octave and a perfect fifth higher than the fundamental, which in this case would be a G5. Now, if you wanted to continue finding more partials, the only thing you'd have to do is keep dividing that string by the partial number. The fourth partial would be played on a string that is one-fourth the length of the fundamental, the fifth would be played on a string one-fifth the length of the fundamental, the sixth on a string one-sixth the length, etc., etc., etc. All right, so this pattern actually continues into registers that go so high that humans can't even hear them being played. For our purposes, however, we only really need to concern ourselves with the first eight. No matter what pitch you start with as your fundamental, each of the partials follow the same pattern. The second partial is always going to be an octave higher than the fundamental. The third partial will always be an octave and a perfect fifth higher. The fourth partial will always be two octaves higher. The fifth, three octaves and a major third higher. The sixth, three octaves and a perfect fifth. The seventh, three octaves and a minor seventh. And finally, the eighth partial will always be four octaves higher than your fundamental pitch. Now, at first glance, these pitches might all seem to be a little arbitrary. But if we look at them through the lens of a major chord, we start to notice that a pattern appears. Our fundamental pitch in this example is the middle C, which happens to be the first or root of a C major chord. The second partial is an octave higher, so it's another C, again, the first or root of the C major chord. Then the third is a G, which is the fifth of the C major chord. The fourth is another root at C, the fifth is an E, which is the third of a major C chord. The sixth is another G or another fifth. The seventh is a B flat, the flat seventh of the C major chord. And then the eighth partial, again, is another root position. No, it's another C. Now, this pattern of root, root, fifth, root, major third, fifth, flat seven, and root turns out to be actually super important to keep in mind when you're orchestrating. I would actually recommend that you memorize it because it has such a big impact, including two different principles for orchestrating chords that we're gonna to cover today. The first is a default model for chord voicings, and the second is known as the 1537 rule. So, starting with the model for chord voicings. There are actually many different ways that we can go about orchestrating chords. But by looking at the overtone series, we can find a perfect blueprint that should serve as our default option. That is, we have open voicings in the low registers and closed voicings in the upper registers. Now, what does all that mean? So open voicings means that when you write a chord, you skip notes in between. Closed voicings mean that when you write a chord, you don't skip any notes at all. If we look at our example of the overtone series for middle C, we see that the first four partials are C4, C5, G5, and C6. If we treat this like a C major chord, we'll notice that we've skipped several notes in between. Specifically, we've skipped E4, G4, and E5. That's two thirds and a fifth. However, if we start with the fourth partial and look at the remaining pitches, we find a fully written closed voicing of a C dominant seven chord. In other words, we have a C7 chord that doesn't skip any notes. We have C6, E6, G6, B flat 7, and C7. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this is exactly what your default chord orchestrations should look like. 
You should be using open voicings in your low registers and closed voicings in your upper registers, which for practical reasons could be considered anything higher than a G3 or the G below middle C. Now, this first idea is a pretty strict rule. It's almost like a law of orchestration. If you don't use open voicings in your lower registers, then the different partials of each note are going to clash together and your sound is going to be all muddy and dissonant. Now, maybe that's exactly the type of sound you're looking for. I wouldn't know, but if you're looking for clear and subjectively more pleasing sound for your music, we want to make sure that you stick to octaves and perfect fifths in your lower voices. Or keep your voicings nice and open. Now, the second idea, which is having closed voicings above G3, isn't nearly as strict. This one is, well, it's more like a helpful suggestion. Some instruments like the strings can do open voicings no problem, while others, like the brass, tend to leak a little bit of their power when they're not written in closed voicings. Either way, the impact of ignoring this suggestion is not going to be nearly as devastating as it would be to ignore the first one. So feel free to do whatever floats your boat. But now that we have a better understanding of this, let's get into the 1537 rule that I mentioned earlier. The 1537 rule simply provides us with an order of priority for reinforcing or doubling the different notes of a chord. It ranks the first, third, fifth, and seventh in terms of importance based on how frequently they appear in the overtone series. The first takes the highest priority because it literally makes up half the notes in the first eight partials. The fifth takes second priority since it appears twice. Then we have the third and then the seventh, which are the least important notes since they only appear once in our first eight partials. The reasoning behind this is that the more times a note appears in the overtone series, the more times you can double it with other voices before its partials begin to clash with those of the other notes in your chord. So if you have too many third notes, for example, then their partials are likely to clash with the other notes and create a muddier sound in your music. It's a much safer option to just simply double your first or fifth instead. Now, all of this music theory is nice and dandy, but let's start talking about how we can apply it practically to our own music, which is actually pretty easy. So whenever you're picking instruments to play your chords, feel free to use as many versions of the full triad as you want. Let's say we have the strings and brass and we want to play a C major chord. We have the viola and violins playing a C5, G5, and E6, with the French horns playing a C4, E4, and G4. Now, these are perfectly fine, since both groups are playing the full chord. We don't really need to start worrying about the 1-5-3-7 rule until we decide to switch things up for a bit. For example, let's say that for whatever reason, I don't want to play the full chord in the French horns, but I still want to use all three horn players. The 1537 rule informs me that the third is the least important of the three notes we're working with. So that's the one I should leave out. Then, when choosing a note to double, I can go either with the first or the fifth, since they're both high priority notes. See how that works? The only other significant time that this rule will come into play will be when you're orchestrating first inversion chords. These are chords in which the third note is played in the root position. That would mean that the C major chord would be spelled with an E in the lowest position instead of the C, which of course means that the E would likely replace your C in the bass line. Now, this is pretty prominent because the bass line forms the foundation for everything that goes on above it. However, according to our rule, the third is one of the least important notes of the chord when it comes to doubling. So if it's already taking up space in the bass line, we don't really want to repeat it in the upper voices. Using our previous example, let's say that we add the tuba, the bass, and the cello as a bass line, and they're playing the third or the E in this case. Since we don't want it repeated too many times, we're just gonna automatically take it out of our upper voices which are the horns and the upper strings. This is gonna leave some empty space for us to work with, so we'll replace those missing notes with doublings of either the first or the fifth. This way, the third isn't repeated too many times, and we get to have it play its role in the bass line without having to worry about our chord sounding too muddy. 
If you've been working with music for a while, you might be wondering at this point what kind of implications this holds for second inversion chords, where the fifth is in the root position. Well, the, the, to kind of put it simply, it doesn't really have any implications. Because the fifth is still a high priority note. It's second only to the first. It appears multiple times in the first eight partials. So you can certainly use it in your upper voices still, if you so choose. So, in summary, the overtone series plays a huge impact in orchestrating your chords. And I really recommend that you commit the first eight partials to memory, which are the root, root, fifth, root, major third, fifth, flat seven, and then another root. From the overtone series, we learn that our default option for voicing chords should always be to have open voicings in the lower register and closed voicings in the upper registers, which just again, for practical reasons, can just be considered anything higher than G3. Finally, the 1537 rule is used to tell us which chord tones are the most important to double. Every section can play a full chord if you'd like, but if you're gonna mix things up, you should keep in mind the proper order of importance. For example, first inversion chords will rarely ever use the third in their upper voices, since it's already taking up enough space in the bass line. All right, so that brings us to the end of another video in the orchestration series. I hope that you found it really helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe to my channel and share it with anyone else you think would really find it helpful. I wanna try and help as many people as possible because it took me a long time to learn all this stuff and I wanna make it more accessible so you don't have to pay hundreds or thousands of dollars to have to learn this stuff. Uh, so stay tuned for my next video, which I'll be sharing next week and it's gonna be on uh, some of my favorite topics, which is learning about the different instruments. In particular, we'll be going over the instrument profiles for the string section. Uh, so yeah, um, in the meantime, uh, just keep working hard and keep on bringing new music into the world.